Domination University. Hello and welcome to Domination University. My name is Chelsea and I am the headmistress of the sex podcast here, Sex and Sex Magic. So please uh, welcome Bella. She is our personal guest today. She is a sex column writer, uh, feminist, BDSM uh, educator, and we are so thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Let's see. I'm Australian Canadian. Um, I'm just getting over a flu, so I'm a little like huskier, which I think sounds sexier Sexy. than my usual exactly. voice. So <laughs> enjoy that. Um, I'm queer. I'm kind of cool sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a witch. I'm yeah. a writer. I play guitar. I'm in a podcast, and I help people like overcome their sexual shame and baggage and live their best lives. Oh my gosh, I love that. Ugh. It's pretty fun. I'm one of those like nerds that like loves my job. Like I wake up every morning, I'm like, fuck yeah, who am I going to help today? That is so fabulous. So, I can cuss, right? Oh, okay. please. Okay. Fucking cuss up a storm, <laughs> please. Um, so how did you get into this realm of work? Like how did, you, where did you start? How did you phase into where you are now? So it's kind of like a cumulative journey, which... Uh, is most centric around my own like sexual awakening, I awesome. guess, and exploration. I like to think of myself as my like longest standing client. But uh, so it was kind of like a complicated on and off journey. I've been doing women's health work for almost ten years. Wow. Okay. And a lot of that has been in personal research. I'm not licensed under any board. Like I'm a total free agent. I'm very transparent about that. For some reason, people often refer to me as like a sex therapist. And I'm like, oh, I'm absolutely not. Like, not at all. I have amazing people I can refer, you know, if you want that. Um, But that's not me. I'm just a free agent. I do my own thing. And I'm lucky enough that people resonate with my energy. And I think I'm absolutely not everyone's cup of tea. And that's sort of what works for me because the people that are drawn to me are the people that are the best fit to work with me. So, Part of, I think, what was the catalyst of me taking this work full-time was I became a birth doula. Oh, Uh, wow. Yeah, and it was really, really beautiful, beautiful work, and I was so pumped to do it. Like, I love women. I've dedicated my life to, like, supporting and empowering women. It's, It's been my life's work for a long time, and... I didn't really have, like, a lot of hands-on experience with childbirth. I And people say to me, like, why did you become a birth doula? And I can't really say why. Incredible. I don't know. I was just like, I want to do that. And um, I was so, so excited because I had I visualized and within my heart visualized, like, the moment of labor and pregnancy, but very specifically labor as regardless of your birth outcome as the most powerful and incredible like potent feminine insane thing not to say that anyone that chooses to not experience that or didn't choose to to not experience it but hasn't experienced that it is not you know deeply feminine and powerful but to me like that experience was the epitome of that so I just kind of wanted to be near it the raw essence yeah I'm like absolutely like let me just like rub up on that energy you know I want to be around that I want to support women through that journey so 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 exciting and unfortunately it was really heartbreaking right I you know maybe part of the combination of fact is is that I'm Australian and I live in America and we have you know neither country has the best birthing system for women uh but America is is particularly terrible at Mm. some of the highest rates of um fetal and maternal uh complications and death wow and it's increasing that's not something that's going down so that's a really big concern to me but but so doing this work, I was expecting one thing and then, and I really enjoyed the prenatal visits and connecting with these women and getting them all pumped up and excited and, and really deeply listening and understanding Sorry. what they wanted for their birth experience and how I could facilitate that without it being about me. Right. It's like... It's I, the ultimate holding space. Yes. Absolutely. So I'm like a formally trained birth doula, and I went through into that experience expecting that, and my heart was completely broken. I was devastated. I honestly can't talk about it without crying, um, 
but it was really devastating for me to see doctors and nurses and honestly sometimes even midwives treat women and I don't say this lightly not just like children but children that have some form of like mental handicap that they couldn't even understand what they were going through I watched nurses lie to laboring women's faces about what they're administering into their IVs and I was grateful that I was there so I could say hey it sounds like you know you're you're saying this is to help this woman relax but that's Pitocin and and my understanding you know exactly yeah uh, and then, you know, no surprise that we need an epidural after that because it becomes very quickly overwhelming. Mm. So I had gone into this experience thinking I was going to be like supporting these women and help them feel like the badasses that they and are. Really, you were a warrior. <sighs> yeah. I was just like, felt like I was having like shields. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I've reached out and touched a doctor's hand as they've gone to pick up scissors and be like, have we discussed this? Because I know we haven't, right? So it was very, very heartbreaking. And then the postpartum work that I did that as part of that, intense, yeah. it's intense and it was a lot of trauma healing and processing and not, well, so while I expected them to feel so empowered through this experience, it was quite the opposite. And then it was, how can I help these women rebuild? Mm. And a big piece of this mm. was around their sexuality. And during labor, the thing that I didn't expect, just because I have no experience with childbirth, is how sensual it is. It's incredibly Absolutely. sensual to the point that it's it's almost kind of erotic at times and certainly can be even more so if people are left to their own devices, right? Like at home totally. and not in a hospital. But, you know, what got the baby in gets the baby out sometimes. It's so true. But that was very... Um, what's the right word for it? It was just like suppressed pushed down, you know, by the doctors, they tried to, you know, do anything they could to quell that whole experience of sensuality. And I felt that that was really damaging to the women. Very clinical. Very clinical. There's nothing clinical about childbirth. I mean, even a C-section, you know, a belly birth is still can be really sensual in this beautiful, uh, as close to natural as possible experience when done correctly. There's Mm -hmm. so many different things you can do. Anyway, I could rant about birth all Did day. Did you do any home births? I actually didn't. I, but uh, part of the catalyst that got me into birth work was a friend of mine delivering at home in her home completely by herself. Like no partners, no friends. Wow. No in the end, she did have a friend come over at the very end um, during like the pushing stage. But she caught her baby. She cut the cord. She did the whole thing herself. Holy shit. And then not to, I don't want to go into that too much for um, legal reasons, but there was a horrible legal recourse against her the state of california was like confused about the legality around that but free breath is legal it's very california. confusing i had a i had i don't want to say doula but i had held space for one of my really good friends who's a healer she's incredible um she had an at-home water birth mm. and i had never experienced anything like that and to hold space so I'm trained in shamanic journeying and healing and things like that and when women get to the point of birth of the baby is crowning things are happening the mother's soul is at this void okay and it's a vortex and it's the closest thing you could get to death Mm -hmm. right but through that comes life right And to see this vortex behind a woman holding this sheer power, it was a water birth too, which was incredible. Her husband was holding behind her. It was the most beautiful thing. I got to photograph all of it. Mm. It was life changing. It showed me like this, we've been doing this for millions and millions of years. This is how we all got here was through this primal fucking yeah experience and to see how strong women are to go through that yeah i thought i loved and respected and Holy honored women before that shit dude after that i was like women are wow. powerhouses like to see someone dig that deep into their soul and find love there it's mm. it's like heartbreaking in the best kind of way oh like my it God. cracks your heart open absolutely i love what you said about the void and this uh maori shaman mm. that i was um acquainted with uh, some time back describes it as the moment before the light touches the stone. 
Mm. And it's mm. just, just, it's such a poignant, incredible wow. thing to be around. Like to just even wow. be in the room is an honor. So Absolutely. to see like the westernization and modernization of birth was truly heartbreaking. And the, the quashing, the suppression of the sensuality and the ripple effect that had postpartum, what I realized I ended up doing in my work was mainly postpartum sexual healing with these women. Wow. And so that, and I was like, this birth stuff is great. To be completely transparent with you, it was very draining on my adrenal system. A hundred percent. And and you're on call. Oh, you don't know what's going to happen. And like you, we were saying, you're a warrior in that position, not uh, a caregiver, really. Yeah, it's very, very intense. So I transitioned to doing like postpartum sexual healing work, and then through word of mouth and references, people just kept sending more and more people my way until I switched right. to doing that full time. And I do it all remotely now, like over uh, Zoom. It's like Skype. Yeah. Over a video chat. Um, it was funny when I was on the Sluts and Scholars uh, podcast, Simone was like, oh, now you're the sexuality doula, which I love. And I'm going to embrace awesome. that a little bit more because it's much more catchy than how I currently describe my work. I so, love that. Yeah, sexuality doula, I think, is just like a very beautiful way to describe what I do because coaching does not resonate with me. Like, I'm not out in the field with you blowing a whistle, being right. like, you know, get in touch with your body, figure over out how to masturbate. Not over here. Yeah, right. exactly. It's like I am truly like holding space, bearing witness, and yes, providing reflection, feedback, asking questions, but all of that is around space holding and creating expansion, not. Brilliant you know, like a forced direction. Yes. So that, um, that is a big part of what brought me to the work as well as my own journey of like sexual healing and ha seeing how powerful those practices were and how much they riveled out into the rest of my life, not just my sex life. I was just about to ask you that. <laughs> so like I've noticed when I first kind of started doing coaching work, I was pretty comprehensive and I didn't specialize in sexuality, but I noticed that once all of the other pieces in people's lives that are coming together, their sex life improves. So I was like, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed with people that I addressed their sex life first, everything else just started improving without me needing to go into it. So it's almost like a shortcut, I think, to have like a so better true. life is uh, to address your sex life. So my philosophy on this is what is the driving force of life is sexuality. That's how we all get here. Yeah. This is how we create. That is the epitome of creation is sexuality. So when it is suppressed or oppressed, like look at women, look at anything that comes around that, trans people, um, it is dampening to your soul. Mm -hmm. When you can't exude who you are sexually or you're afraid to or you're ashamed to or – you're afraid people won't understand you or anything of that nature is damaging to your soul and to the rest of your like abilities. Yeah. And sexual shame particularly gets really dark really quickly for a lot of people in their Holy life. Holy shit. And not to say that it's like the cause of terrible things happening, but I've noticed like in personal research, things like uh, really prolific serial killers, they usually have some like very, very intense sexual shame. Yes issues uh, so it can get bad very much so I, I, I just wish I understood why like as a world and as a culture and particularly in America we're so hesitant to talk about sexuality when it should be like the you know sixth vital sign you know it's like how, why does nobody ask in the doctor's office how's your sex life absolutely even if you're single great how's it with yourself right how's the romantic relationship with yourself it's so fascinating. I have two points to give on that. One, when I was in school for aesthetics, I had uh, a friend named Nikki from the Republic of Congo. And she said when they were young, like becoming women or whatever, the elder women would take them into classes and show them how to masturbate and how to be in touch with your body and how that makes you a better lover. Wow. And... I'm like, whoa, what? And she's like, Our, the marriage success rate is huge. Wow. The, like, the way we carry ourselves with confidence and reassurance is huge. The no, to, to know how to um, embrace, like, 
sensuality mm. and intimacy and know what to do for my partner as well that was like game changing to me and yeah. at first baffling i was like wait what what did you do but then it made sense i was like holy shit that is so fascinating learning through masturbation is like yeah, the it best. seems like such a simple concept, it but is. people are so uncomfortable with it. It's so fascinating. Like why pleasure isn't a very key part of sex education nationwide and in schools and from the time that children are young, honestly, like there's yes. age appropriate conversations to have around pleasure and sensuality. And Absolutely. when I have clients come to me that are very, very repressed in even their sensuality, not just their sexuality, because mm-hmm. to me, those are very, very different. Things. Absolutely. Um, I start with really, really simple things like, okay, what's your favorite fruit? Okay. Mm-hmm. Can you eat that really slowly? Can you smell it? Can you touch it? Can you like savor every aspect of it? You know, that's being sensual Mm. and you take a long slow walk and listen to the birds like before I even get close to sex I'm like can we get sensual first brilliant and you can teach that to little kids that's not inappropriate you know absolutely slow down when you eat eat slowly eat mindfully don't watch something while you eat sit outside look at your plate you know those are little things that young children can really understand and grasp Mm -hmm. and build that foundation so that yeah when you get older things like for example sexual assault before it is you know very very intense it can manifest as coercion right right if you have a foundation of pleasure and sensuality, you're going to feel the energy of mm. someone trying to get you to do something you're not interested in. Uh, and it's like you don't even engage in it because you're like, what? Yeah, I I'm don't not interested that. in that. No. Get out of here with that. Yeah. Shut that down. Holy shit. So like the idea to me, I love talking to clients about where is your sex education and – Maybe like seven, seven to eight times out of ten, they'll say I didn't have one. I'm like, oh, so you did. It was silence. That was your education, Mm. that you can't talk about sex. So it shouldn't be this like one conversation. Because the, sorry, the other two or three will say I had one conversation with my parents or like I had a bit in school. Hmm. One conversation with your parents also almost always at a time that's like way past the most common times of sexual activity. Like it's usually when they're like 17 to 19 and I'm like most – People at that age have had some level of sexual interaction, even if it's just kissing. Right. It needs to be this, like, lengthy, ongoing conversation, not just, like, one and done. Absolutely. Birds and the bees. How, out of, Go watch the birds. Go watch the bees. Yeah. That's the sex education. Out of curiosity, did you have a open dialogue with your parents about sexuality? I love my parents so much, and they're amazing. They did, like, such a great job. But absolutely not. Really? Absolutely not. Sex, like, wasn't really talked about in my household. Um, my father, who's passed away, he had his own issues around repression. And that really tied to even, in, like, in, what do I want to say? Like, uh, embodying sensuality. Mm. Which is really hard for me because I've always identified as, like, a very sensual feminine person. Mm-hmm. And... I have a lot of memories of things like a woman on TV that was doing nothing overtly sexual. Maybe he just had some beautiful feminine clothes on. And maybe it was a bit flirtatious, you know. And he would, like, talk openly and out loud about how terrible that was. And it's, like, attention-seeking wow. and bad. So for me, wow, um, a lot of my sex education has been unlearning and exploring for myself what brings me pleasure, what brings me joy, where my boundaries are. And I think, honestly, like, my own kind of a horror show roller coaster of discovering my sexuality I think is why I'm so good at my job because I really understand where people come from when they're in that same place because I remember how it felt that's I just want to touch on something sex education is unlearning past conditioning yeah that's how I I feel like my work is like 80 percent helping people unlearn and unpack and then and that's a hard work the tiring work the deep work for them that doesn't feel fun I always have to say to people like in intake I'm like this isn't always gonna feel fun and light and cute like honestly a lot of this is looking at your demons some shadow work for sure. yeah but that's good because you dismantle everything that you think you know and then you're able to assess like brick by brick does this like is this really true for me and I one of my mentors was telling me we were having this conversation a couple weeks ago about like why are we so reluctant to give up aspects of ourselves that we've lost from our parents and Mm. she was saying 
you know, sometimes you go into someone's house and you'll be like, oh, that's a nice kettle. And they're like, oh, actually, I don't really like that kettle, but my parents gave it to me. And um, I'm really um, minimalistic. So if I don't like a gift, I just like lovingly give it away. Right. Um, so I'm kind of just like, oh, that's funny. Like, why would you want something in your space that doesn't resonate with you? But we don't like to give gifts away. And I think emotionally, it's a bit the same way. That's what my mentor was saying. Like, when your parent has given it to you, even if you in your heart know it doesn't really resonate, it was a gift. And so can we honor that and release that with, with so much love and not judging where our parents are at because right. they're at where they're at. Totally. But also the more you level up, the also opportunity you provide for your parents to learn and grow through you if that's something they're, they're open to. It's very. I had the opposite experience with my parents growing up. My parents were very open about sexuality, sensuality, and things like that from a very young age. Mm. My mom bought me my first vibrator. Oh, that's so good. My mom, like, was the educator to all of my friends that they couldn't ask their parents anything, but she would give them a straight answer Mm. and say, no, this is, you need this, this, or this, or that's not okay, and opened up a really, uh, great dialogue that showed me that this isn't bad and it needs to be respected if anything yeah. um now in my own journey of course I've fallen through the cracks on that and wanted to explore my own way and now I'm rebuilding <clears throat> within the space of my partner and mm-hmm. husband that can hold that for me and experience all these new things and also let go of the things that no longer serve me and it's really really interesting it's beautiful to get that other perspective as well because I think a lot of people view whatever their childhood experience is Mm. was as something that really shapes you and it does in a way but it's very malleable still I think we're constantly growing and learning if we're open to evolving that is so true I think about that when uh you do inner child work Mm. And how you can rebuild and bust through those traumas that were on set. But you yourself can go back and reassure yourself that you made it through this. Everything's okay. um, This isn't your fault. Whatever you needed at that moment where you didn't get that, you can heal yourself from that. And having the grace for our parents too, I think, is really important. They did the best they can. And when you're a kid, like they're heroes, you know, for a lot of people, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, they see their parents as like invincible and they have all the answers. And the older I get, I'm just like, oh, holy shit. They were just regular people trying to figure it out. humans, man. Oh, man. (laughs) I thought that was different. And it feels really good to be able to have grace for your parents. I love the way you say that. And yes, I think that is definitely a building block on how to be a better person too and let go of the things that don't resonate with you anymore but also show appreciation yeah and I think part of it is in my own life my personal life and my professional life I've seen that one of the things that is often the most hurtful to us is when someone else's best isn't your best Maybe it's even your worst. The worst you could do is someone else's best. And how can we hold that and love that and cherish that without making them a shitty person or someone that's trying to hurt you and just accepting that they're at where they're at? That extends out of our parents into everyone in our lives. Usually everyone's doing their best. That hit me deep. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I think that is beautiful. For sure. It, just to give grace to everyone. Yeah. Like, everybody's trying. We're all just here bumping around, trying to do yeah. our best and enlighten and brighten as much as we can and take it for what it is. Like, f- or find the silver lining or... Yeah, like, what did this teach me instead levity. of why is it happening to me, that woe is me kind of thing. Exactly. And being able to turn that grace to yourself as well. And particularly when it comes to sex. So That's many hard. people... Yeah. I, and I noticed particularly like male identified people, they really, really struggle to try things that are new because they don't want to like look stupid or right. do it wrong. And like, hey, sex can be fun and exploratory and silly and you can make mistakes and laugh about it. You know, Absolutely. you don't have to have it perfect and get it right. 
That's like, almost more boring. Right? Yeah. Of like where's the, where's the routine play? Routine of like, ew, no, <laughs> I cannot. I am a Scorpio to the max. I want it weird and I want it intense. Hell yeah, Give Scorpio rising. It. Hello, we bring in the heat up in this joint. So yeah. But people, I think so many people see sex as these like really defined things, whatever you view mm. it as. And <sighs> I think sex is to me, it's purposeless play. Like sometimes maybe you're, you're trying to conceive a child. So maybe there is a little purpose in that one. But most of the time for most people, it's just purposeless play. Play and, it, and it can be that you want to connect with your partner or you don't care about connecting with someone. You just want to feel really, really good. Right. But society doesn't give us a lot of room for like purposeless play and pleasure. It's pretty interesting. When I, when I traveled, I went to Israel last year um, and they were talking about, well, I started conversations about sex and sexuality and they were saying how Americans are fucking so freak like they're like what are you guys even into i saw like a mayonnaise balloon <laughs> like what the hell's going on here and over there it's not as oppressed sexuality yeah. is not oppressed even like men are more metro if you want to say that even the most masculine are still like embracing the feminine at the same time but i think while oppressing this kind of stuff it makes us do backdoor things. Yeah, of course. If that makes sense. Because you have to, like, that need doesn't go away. Right. It's it's just going to, it's like water. It's just going to flow in and find another way around. Exactly. Yeah, it's like mayonnaise balloons. Right. Or, like, you know, dressing up in crazy ways or whatever. It's like, cool, whatever floats your boat. Right. But... A lot of the time I've, I've noticed professionally that when we start really addressing the root cause and getting more comfortable with embracing our sexuality, mm -hmm. that often a lot of people's like spe very specific kinks and stuff, sometimes they kind of melt away and it creates space for different ones to form and, so and explore. So fascinating. <laughs> this is, I saw this meme that my friend posted this morning and it was like a picture from The Office, that TV show, and it was like... <laughs> and a pillow over there of The Office, yes. <laughs> it was like a... Pam having to look at this pitch two identical pitches and he was like one of them was labeled childhood traumas and the other one was labeled your kings and he was like can you show me how these are different and she's like I can't it's the exact same photo but it's like sometimes we create this stuff so that we can heal something that's so beautiful it's so but true. if we were also able to create a society that didn't have that level of repression people could just discover their sexuality for themselves exactly isn't that nice it's so interesting i ah uh, well put, Bella. Oh, my god. I'm gosh. worried, though, because, like, I don't want my kings to go away. I like my kings. No. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I wonder if I, like, get too healed and evolved. I won't, like, want that anymore. But. No, I think your kings will evolve. Yeah. With it. True. It'll just become a different thing. You're going to be like, I want seven candles. Okay? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but seven candles really do it for me in the ambiance. Mm. Or whatever the fuck you want to do. Seven's but, a lucky number. Yeah. Hey, you never know. We don't know. And that's the beauty of kinks and also being open with your sexuality at the same time yeah. is finding out what really does do it for you. I have talked to so many women that don't know because mm -hmm. they're, ha they're going through the motions of sex because that's expected of them, but they have never explored or discovered anything yeah. of what they desire. Or if they have, it was like on route with their partner and exactly. not for themselves. Right. Um, one of the, mm. the biggest challenges I've faced in my sex life is the introduction to BDSM for me was in a really unhealthy, abusive relationship. Oh, shit. So it was very complicated because I was like, this is like very interesting and, and maybe everything I've been trying to... I, I feel like I've been in BDSM relationships in all my romantic ones, but they were never defined, defined and explored, right? right. Um, I just naturally like attract dominant people into my life. Um that's how it's been but that was very confusing because I was like I I'm throughout the course of a relationship realizing this is unhealthy and abuse and then on the other hand you've brought this stuff into my life that I've never explored you know in this way before so it was really pivotal moment for me when I walked away from that relationship 
to decide for myself, I remember thinking like, are you going to throw all of this away? Because that person is, you know, a piece of shit. Um, (laughs) I'm sure they have their good qualities, but, uh, (laughs) or are you going to like really do the hard work and explore this for yourself? So I went through a period of celibacy and I dived really deep into my sexuality in a way I never had before of without any witness, without any audience, without any partner, what still turns me on. Right. And that was fucking hard work. Holy shit. But doing that has, of course, created this amazing sex life that I live in now. I'm lucky enough to experience and really being a huge part of informing my professional work and being able to support other people on that journey. I'm scared of like people that do the similar work to me that haven't had some kind of, you know, personal exploration there's like oh everything's been perfect always i'm like fuck that you are hiding some shit somewhere deep yeah it is really fascinating i love bdsm it's the best isn't it the best i (laughs) absolutely the amount of anxiety and stress relief that i get from it is actually incredible i love rope work and rigging Mm. and doing all that stuff. Uh, Shibari is beautiful to me. There is something sensual about it. And that's the thing. Everybody thinks BDSM is like hardcore pain. And it's like, that is a piece of it, but it is not only that. There's so much more. And it's a lot of psychological training and uh, exploration. I talked to an author get her name i have her books over here damn it (laughs) i'll put it at the uh, description sorry folks um she was a bdsm author and she's also a sub Mm. and she was explaining to me how she helps rape victims Mm. through bdsm and i was like what yeah she said it creates control back in their lives so they can put themselves through that But also know they're in absolute control and this is not going to happen the same way it did in the past. And it's extremely healing for them Mm. and they get super empowered. I thought my brain, I was like, wouldn't they want to be a dom? And she's like, Mm. no, there's something to subspace that lets you let go and heal. And it's really interesting. And that actually made me want to switch mm. and try being a sub because uh, I am a dom dominantly. So, but now I'm like you know, playing on the switch card <laughs> here. Uh, and I've had experiences where my body is letting go after uh, a session. Yeah. And I'm crying. And like, I don't know what escaped me. It's the best way I can describe it is energy work yeah like like I'm a I am a healing practitioner and I've done that for 10 years this is almost exactly the same yeah it is so fascinating it's holding space for people and allowing their deepest darkest things to come up and release yeah and love them and hold the space for them to do that and experience that Yeah, it's a shame there's so much stigma around healing, particularly sexual assault victims, healing through BDSM and and sex in general on a larger scale. And I'm I'm not really sure why that is. Like, I've had someone say that to me, like, oh, you must have been raped or whatever to be into this. And I was like, I have actually been raped, but I was into this before then. And uh, it's been really healing on my journey, as it has for a lot of people. Like, I'm not sure. Yeah, I've never been able to figure that out, why people... I think they see the hardcoreness, and that scares a lot of people. They think maybe you're just recreating the same thing that happened. Right, right. But even still, even if someone was doing that, like, all right, they're doing that. That's some part of their healing journey. Right. And they're recreating it in a situation that is really safe. like And extremely controlled. Yeah, that's the thing I wish people that aren't in the BDSM community knew about BDSM more, is how much control for one how much control subs and bottoms have a hundred percent i'm so glad that you are touching on this and like in general the yes. level of boundaries and communication like i've i'm oh working God. on a piece right at the moment about how 
vanilla i kind of hate that term just because like so many people lately have been saying it's a slur but it's not it's just like there's two different types right like it's like yeah. BDSM and vanilla. anyway so no to anyone listening i'm using this with so much love the with term love. vanilla yeah <laughs> um is like how vanilla people can incorporate the principles of bdsm in their life without regardless of if you do or don't want to incorporate any of the sexual aspects because right. boundaries communication consent but like really the ex the clear expectations is so amazing in BDSM. Oh. Isn't that amazing? It's so You can say to someone like, this awesome. is what I'm expecting, you know, right. these kinds of things. Is that something that would be interesting to you? Do you want to provide that? Can we do that in a session? And not, like, I think some people think talking about it takes the mystery out. It doesn't. Absolutely it's amazing. Not. It's almost deeper. You're yeah. connecting deeper because this is something that you wouldn't normally say to somebody yeah. in conversation and you are showing a side of yourself that you hide, right? Yeah. Or that society wants you to hide. And I think there's a part of your brain that turns off when you mm. have some level of understanding of what to anticipate because you're not like, oh, will they be doing this? Won't they be doing that? Right. You know, and you can just really be there and yeah, you know, drop into top or bottom space. But more than that, just be really, really present and your brain isn't Mindful. constantly yes. like scanning or searching for, you know, danger. Yes, it's so true. And in a non-sexual, like romantic way, for me, BDSM has been really healing because I'm a very, very, uh, one of my love languages is acts of service. So like just as a expression of my love, even for my friends and stuff, I'll be like, can I get you a glass of water? You know, I've prepared this, like people always joke that there was like food in my house. I'm like, yes. let me feed you, you know, yes. I'm a very giving person. That's just like how I express my love. Mm. And in past relationships, people were like, oh, that's good. That feels really nice. And then they quickly just start taking advantage of it and like, deplete like it, you. Yeah. Like they try to suck all my light out mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, and in a BDSM relationship, it's like, okay, it's really clear cut and dry. Like what I bring, what you bring, is that imbalance, you know, and I'll have check-ins with my partner, like, how are we feeling? Is everything imbalanced? Do we need to adjust things? Oh, like, it's so, it so much communication. The, exactly. It opens the communication line. There's no guessing. There's no, yeah. does he or she like this? Or I don't know if I'm doing this right. And uh, are they going to judge me? I can't imagine the stress of being in a vanilla relationship. Holy it would be shit. so much anxiety for me. Yeah, like you said, like, do, does she like it when I touch her like that? You know, right. just all these little things like that. This inner di or monologue that's going on of all of your, like, fear <laughs> that God. is being pumped into <laughs> your sexual it. experience. It's like... Yeah, this uh, isn't good. I know, like, we have to, in life, be comfortable with gray areas, but, you know, for me, BDSM does have a lot of black and white, and I really like that. I one. love it. Oh, my God. It, it, <laughs> for me, I love control. Mm. I am one of those people, to a point of almost demolition. I'm like, I need to control everything, so I actively try to release that, but... One space that I can mm. exercise that is BDSM. Yeah, you can just let it out. And let it out. I have control of what I'm writing down in a uh, transcript. Not a transcript, but a, what do they call that? A piece. Oh, my God. It's fucking. All right. Anyways, clear-cut <laughs> boundaries. And it makes you feel really safe in yourself. And also, like, you have control. And the control that subs have is actually more yeah, than doms 100%. and it's really interesting because so many people are like no doms uh have all the power and that uh, i guess it's like they've been gifted way, all the power but only they can only play with the power that they've been gifted and yes. they can only explore in that area right like that's it's so specific and, I, and people I don't think understand that like you can only top someone as much as they're submitting to you and Absolutely. allowing yes and of course anything out of that is abuse so it's like yes. it's very like it's very clear cut once you've experienced it like how you could see the difference and I think for me obviously there's a variety of factors that contributed to this for me but I do think BDSM was a big piece of it as a person now Oh my gosh, I have the strongest boundaries and I'm so calm and kind with them. Mm. Whereas before I got into that relationship that introduced me to BDSM and yes, was abusive, I didn't. And I was such a doormat and I just loved people and I wanted to be nice to everybody. And that's great, sweetie, but that doesn't work if people don't earn it from you. Like, Absolutely not. You can't just hand that out like candy. Hell no. 
So I think there's a huge amount of benefit to be gained from BDSM for people on an emotional level outside of like, it feels good because sex is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Kinky sex and is fun. also really fun. And I love leather. So oh, yeah. sorry. And, and rope, like you said. Like oh my rope God, is such it. a spiritual, incredible. I've just it, started exploring and delving into the world of Shabar. And it's been it's really beautiful already. So fascinating. I had no idea. If someone told me, like, 10 years ago, like, you're going to be super into rope. That's going to get you. Like, you'll love it. That's going to be your sexual enterprise of whatever. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? Rope? Okay. Now I'm like, oh, my God. I feel like if anyone told me anything that I'm doing now, now? 10 years ago, I'd be like, wow, that's great. <laughs> the other day I did this photo shoot and I got some of the photos back and I have all these, like, butterflies in my hair and yeah. I was wearing this, like, tutu thing and I, I had this moment of thinking – I feel like the warrior fairy princess that oh. I wanted to be when I was four. Oh my God. And I wish I could go back to that little person and like give her a hug and be like, you can. everything Absolutely. worked out, you know? Yes. That's inner child work. You could do that. Do that in meditation. I swear to you, it changes your life. You yeah. can go back and there's no time. I haven't done a lot of inner child work. I did <sighs> like maybe eight years ago but like in therapy yeah I think it would be interesting for me to like do it because my Especially meditation now. practice is yeah. like very important to me now you so. have like razor sharp focus razor sharp razor right? sharp baby. cut myself with it yeah like, oops sorry I'm not a masochist for yeah. no reason baby <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much um okay so are there any little tips or tricks that you want to help our listeners with into diving into their own sexuality uh, maybe that they're budding or or interested in exploring? I feel like people always ask me this question and it's hard because I don't really believe there's like any quick, easy thing you totally. can do to embrace your sex life. But some of the things that I would say to start off is really, it's, it's, it kind of sounds boring, but like really is meditation and reflection and journaling and particularly centric around Asking yourself questions. I think like question asking is really, really powerful of your partner, but of yourself when you're discovering your sexuality or wanting to embrace it deeper. And so, for example, you're like, oh, I really like doggy style. Let's like just pick something easy and vanilla. You're like, I really like doggy style. Okay. Spend some time sitting with yourself and ask yourself, do you? Right. Or did maybe a partner used to have really like it? Mm. Or you've seen it in porn and you think it looks really hot. And all that stuff's cool and fine. And I'm not saying any of it's bad. But being able to really like ask yourself these questions and start unpacking it is really powerful. So that'd be one thing I'd say. Um, another is invest in your masturbation. A lot of people feel like it is something that's going to create distance between like them and a partner or they're going to come dependent on it. And that's just issues of fear and anxiety that are cropping up and that's totally normal. Breathe through it. But investing in a sexual and romantic relationship with yourself is so important. Mm. And if you have a really specific way you masturbate, cool. You know that works. you got that in the back burner. Don't need to worry about the fact that you are not going to be able to come because you know how to make yourself come or you know how to make yes. yourself feel good if you don't come. Let's explore some different ways now because you've got that one down pat. And that's really challenging for people because it gets frustrating. They're oh like, oh, God. you know, I want to keep raising up the numbers till I get to a 10 as yes. an orgasm. And they get irritated if they get stuck at a two. But like, can you, can a two feel good? Can, can that be okay for now? And one of the things that, that, that ties into that I teach is non-goal oriented masturbation. For me, masturbation is a very, very key factor for a lot of people's sex lives. And I love to ask new clients, like, what is it like? Well, like, what's a, a really nice sex session with your partner like if you have a partner? Or if you don't, like, can you tell me what it would look like? And then I let them really, like, hash that out and, and think about that. I say, okay, great. How do you masturbate? And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, I kind of just, like, turn my vibrator on and then just, like, turn my brain off. Sometimes I watch porn, sometimes I don't. It's like, that's not romantic at all. Honey, like, if you did that with a partner, they would be like, Where's the wow. foreplay? Where's yeah. the romance? Where's so the connection? Yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like put a pillow over my face because I feel disconnected from you, right? Uh -huh. So, like, how can we deepen that sexual and romantic relationship with ourselves, but in a way that's really personal? So, like, I hate it when people are just like, oh, light candles, sprinkle rose petals. If that makes you feel sexy and romantic, awesome. But for some people, that's rope. Right. Or it's like wearing your sweatpants and watching Broad City, and like, that's how you like relax and get down beforehand, you know? Yeah. Let it be a personal 
journey, but let it be an exploration that can unfold. Absolutely. And so a lot of people these days are trying to remove the goal of orgasm from partnered sex. And, you know, like that's great because it should be pleasure prioritized, not goal oriented. But like, why don't you transfer that to your solo sex? Because people see solo sex as just very, very different to partnered sex. And I don't think it should be. So that's like a big piece of like my work and, and what I try to encourage people to do. So that would be a really big place that I would tell people to start, which it's actually really challenging for a lot it's of people. It's so hard. I've tried to do it. I'm still doing it to like re, redo my self-sex because mm-hmm. I've done it in one way my entire life. And I'm like, but it's very shallow. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like goal goal oriented I yeah need to get even this people off. okay let's go when I like come on podcasts and have people like yourself that are really like sexually liberated almost always they're like oh even still my sexual relationship it takes like talking to me to realize that their sexual relationship with themselves like isn't stacking up right it's a it's an ongoing process like I feel like there's always gonna be something to explore or work on yeah but the more and more I do that, the closer I get to a better, healthier sex life. And who doesn't want that? Right. And you, you discover so much cool stuff about yourself if oh you have God. this like open-minded, inquisitive, exploratory relationship to your sexuality. And like just the other day I was masturbating and I discovered something else I liked. I was so excited to tell my partner. What? I was like, oh, I can't wait for him to come home so I can be like I this, this cool thing. Like I like it, you know, and like that's such a joyful, you know, it's People, I I feel like I talk so much about like children and sex in a way, but um, that's like a lives. childlike yeah. way to to view sex, and I think that's like the healthiest way to view it, like without all these like goals and expectations. And one of my biggest pet peeves is I almost every single client I have says I don't have time, Bella. I don't have time, and I'm like, oh my god, what do you, do have, you time have time for to check then? your phone? Like, <laughs> do you have time to like? How long does it take you to poo? Twenty minutes? Are you taking twenty minutes to poo? Because you could probably do it in five, and then you've got fifteen and then you minutes. Got fifteen to minutes spare. to knock it out, yeah. And like, I think part of it is they see it like it's this big production that they have to come. So when it, when people feel that way, I'll often say, okay, your homework is to have sixty seconds of pleasure every day and set a timer on your phone, and it can look however it looks. It doesn't always have to be genital touching. Like if I'm sitting at my desk writing all day and not seeing clients, that's really hard for me. So I'll like, you know, stroke my arms and like just move my hips in my seat and I'll stretch. And to me, that's that's pleasure and connecting with myself. Absolutely. So like you can masturbate for 60 seconds. Get out sure. of here. <laughs> yeah, please. You've please got time. <laughs> actually make it mandatory. And if you like make the time to do that, you're you're saying to yourself that it's important to you mm. and you're prioritizing it. And I'll be so surprised if you don't find that you have like more time in your day after that and you're happier and you're in a better mood and people are nice to you. The way it ev- like elevates your mood yeah. is insane. Yeah, people always say like, you're so cheerful and optimistic and stuff. And that's true. I'm like, as a person, like if you live with me, I'm kind of like that a lot of the time. And like, not to say I don't get down. And when I get down, I really feel my feelings, but I prioritize pleasure. So I look for it. Even when something horrible happens, like I know this is a really intense example and maybe one that not everyone can relate to, but when my father passed away, that was a beautiful, beautiful experience for me. And it was heartbreaking. It was the most emotionally painful thing I've ever gone through. But there was so much beauty and joy in it, even in the moments that I was like broken down sobbing because I was able to look for the parts of it that, that were beautiful and had pleasure in them, like being able to be there for him and hold him as he passed from this world into the next And there was, so even something that intense, it doesn't negate any of the grief to be able to find like beautiful, joyful moments and moments of connection and and gratitude and appreciation is that I'm sure, you know, meditation really helps us like look for this in our lives. Whatever you focus on is what you see. Ooh, another deep one from Bella. (laughs) Can can we write in the heart center here, sister? I can't turn it off. (laughs) But yeah. like I, I uh, yeah, I live in, in like a deep way and in connection with myself and 
I'm a second generation of psychic medium, so I've spent my whole life Absolutely. being like the freak, you know. I resonate with that a hundred percent. People the same like way. say to me, like, when did you realize you were like really weird or something? And I'm like, Oh, I never did. I just realized that other people weren't that way. I was like, Oh, this Girl. is something that I have to yeah. like rain shift with people. Oh my god. So my I'm mom used to like getting into it. That's so weird. She's like, I thought everybody had this. Mm-hmm. Like I thought this was normal. I would be like a little like, kid telling oh. people about their like dead grandparents yes, and they'd be like, how do you know this shit? And I was like, oh, I thought we all did. Yeah. Or do you, <laughs> do you see? Do you have sight? I used to when I was younger. Okay. I get visuals now. So like they'll, um, spirits will show me like a very specific visual. So there might be like, I'm trying to think of something that I've had recently. Uh, uh, yeah, like jewelry or things like that. Mm. They're like a, or, um. Like the ocean or like some yeah. kind of like really specific visual or they come through my body. Like I had one client once which was like really freaked me out where I had like water bubbling up and choking me in my throat. And I was like, is there, s- who was the person that like drowned? Cause and this is fucking bad. Yeah, I was like, is there coming through and I need them to like stop. Chill the fuck out. Yeah. And she was like, oh, I can't think of anyone. And then she was like, oh wait, my grandfather, he had like a lung complication and like all of this like fluid came up and, and choked and drowned him. So he like dry drowned. So they'll do things like that too. But yeah, I used to have the sight when I was younger. So I, so do you get more audio and, or clear the, audience? And yeah. The best way I can describe it is it's like someone else is thinking in my head, I but it's not it me. Like that. Oh, the fuck? <laughs> oh yeah. Give me a high five. Oh my God. I'm like, God. who thought that? Cause that wasn't me. Like it's really odd. It's just nice to have, um, confirmation confirmation yeah. that <laughs> a I'm not alone b i'm not crazy yeah i go i go through that all the time i've had this my entire life i was very similar i would talk to people when i was a child about whatever the fuck dead relatives would come talk to me i could but i still see color on people mm. so i you i'm a very i have a very open third eye mm. and i see color specific things thoughts Mm. but like I get it all from them and I'm like what the fuck and then I learned how to when I was around 16 turn it on and off because I was getting bombarded I was Mm -hmm. getting like psychic attacks and things of that nature so that was really really crucial for me to like learn how to switch these on and off and then use shamanic ways to safely travel and talk to uh ancestors and people that have passed because so I was just channeling I was doing yeah I'm not the best at work. turning it on and off maybe you can teach me yeah I, could, I would love to help you with that um but yeah it was really fascinating uh when I would do mediumship I would cry the whole time something mm. it wasn't me crying it was that happens to me a lot in session sort of uh entering into my field that would turn on this water emotion mm-hmm. and I couldn't stop it and one day, I had a client come in to get a session, and it turned into a mediumship session. And I am not religious. I'm half Jewish, half Catholic. I don't fucking believe in either, really. <laughs> um, but I had a giant winged white being come down and say, I'm going to assist you with this healing. My name's Michael, and uh, I'm going to make it easier for you. Didn't cry the whole fucking session. And I was like, what the hell is this? I call my aunt. My mom's side is all Catholic. And I'm like, can you fucking explain this to me? Because, like, I haven't read the Bible. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I didn't believe in angels till five minutes ago. What just happened? And she's like, that's an archangel. Like, that is the yeah, healing Archangel angel. Michael. I've read I'm the like, Bible. Whoa. <laughs> what? That's so <sighs> creating protection is really, really crucial for, like, uh, any kind of psychic abilities because I've. Everybody has this ability too, I think, but some people are predisposed like we are. Yeah. We were just like some people are predisposed to be fucking Olympic runners right. that can run the a beautiful free, singers. right, or yeah. amazing singers with a crazy range. Or not saying that no one else can sing or learn how to sing. Right. It's some people are just naturally good at things. It's a gift, yeah. it's, in other words. So I've learned how to hone all of that in 
Uh, Speaking of the Bible, isn't it funny? I think the Bible is so funny. I read the whole thing cover to cover. And it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful book. Like if you read it like with an open mind and, you know. That's my problem. No one's like making you read it. It's just very, very interesting. I just like learning about religions. I'm not religiously affiliated and have a spiritual, you know, practice of my own. But I'm not affiliated with any group or religion. But it's very, very beautiful text. Like a lot of them are. Like a lot of religious texts are so beautiful and have these like incredible messages but then they just get so twisted for other people's reasons and create such horrible sexual repression and shame and there's there's nothing about that in the bible like jesus was like you know i don't believe any of it was real but yeah he was like you know the story of this fictional person was like super rad he was like a feminist he like took care of sex workers he washed their feet he told everyone like don't hate your neighbor you know love them and then it's just being share the you know. fan fiction is what I like to say. The fan fiction Brilliant. version uh, of the Bible has really taken off oh in this like God. horrible, <laughs> damaging way. It's nuts. Anyone that's like very hateful in religion, I'm like, you should reread the Bible because it's beautiful. Oh my gosh. I've had to tell, uh, I lived here from Nashville. Tear up. No, I it's love like a beautiful that. text that's like take care of other people like it really th- for me like the main thing I took away is like take care of people love everyone equally don't be judgmental and people that are like suffering particularly like the homeless and stuff like take extra care of them absolutely and like all I ever hear from like people that are extremely like aggressively religious is like hate different things that you shouldn't do and I'm like do you even do any community service like it's it got so twisted what I've realized bad fan fiction, bad yeah, fan fiction, is people that are the most religious are the least spiritual. Mm. I love that. That's so true. And it's really fascinating. I, I like I was saying, I went to Israel and I made friends with rabbis. Like I was just hanging out with them, and the I would explain to them my spirituality and how I connect and do all these things, and they're like what yeah. I'm like what do you mean you don't connect they're like no it's more of like a ritual that we do yeah it's not it loses its meaning right they're not but I think the difference between spirituality and religion is spirituality is internal realization and actualization yeah and religion is giving that power away to something to say I'm a part of a group you know I agree and what I think is really risky and dangerous about religion to me the the most dangerous thing is outsourcing your judgment like I always say this you should be your own judge and juror and you need to consider your own morals and come up with your own set of morals and not just ascribe to anybody else's and I don't think you should be able to be like oh whoops my bad like I'm eating a bit of bread and drink a bit of wine and say I'm sorry like you should actually like make penance with the people that you've hurt and if that's right. yourself do that with yourself uh, but yeah, dude like don't outsource that shit like that's you that's on that's you that's on you <laughs> accountability yes accountability folks yes it's, it's dangerous but it's, community's nice taking care of others that is i nice. totally it understand just gets so twisted. yeah it's and it's i feel like once someone starts telling you or applying their ideas or how they connected or whatever because usually like that's how pastors are or priests or whatever they're the mouthpiece yeah that is the direct line, right? Quote Which unquote. Is dangerous. Uh, right. So people do whatever to be a part of that, but really, if they did any work on themselves, they'd realize they are also that. Yes, exactly. And they can connect to that themselves and attain information. Or and those people who, like haven't read the Bible. It's crazy. Like I read it because I went to um. For two years, I went to a Catholic girl's school and I was like, already knew I was queer by that stage. So I was like, am I going to hell? Like, I don't mm-hmm. think so. Like, cause I'd never really heard about this stuff before. Like my mom's spiritual. I never like got into that. So I was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to hell. Cause I think it's, it's, I don't believe in hell for one, but I think, you know, love who you love. And, but I was like, people would like quote shit and say it was bad. And I was like, I want to know what they're quoting and I want to be able to quote things back to them so that was kind of why I read it that's so smart and there's like three there's like about three from memory and like to be honest it was almost 10 years ago over 10 years ago um 
there's about like three or four references to it um homosexuality being a sin and it's just like such a not a big deal and we need to factor in like historical context for like procreation and uh exactly a a friend of mine brenda marie davis who has the god is gray youtube and podcast um I met her through her podcast and being on it and she told me something really interesting that I'd never heard, Hmm. which is that there is in the old Testament, there's, um, there's conflict or disagreement over a translation around homosexuality. And they may have been actually saying, uh, older men having sex with young boys. So like male, male pedophilia. And she was like, which do you think like the idea of God or a higher power or whatever, which do you think, they would find a sin pedophilia or just like regular homo right like nobody fucking cares what consenting adults do but yeah like of course pedophilia is horrifying and very wrong so like if you factor in that mis potential potential mistranslation then it doesn't even say it exactly it's really fun and i think it comes from like repression from other yeah. people of going, I kind of, I kind of resonate or feel yeah. that way too. Oh yeah. shit. Tell them it's bad. I can't let this out. No. Yeah. No. Like there's so many like fetishes that I'm not into and I could hear someone talk about it all day. I'd be right. like, oh, that's fascinating. Absolutely. But yeah, I guess Failure. if there was something I was like secretly hiding around myself, I'm like, don't talk about that. Yeah. Because then I might say something I'm like getting know. a boner. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I can't hide my boner in church. Yeah. I'm know? sorry. I got a boner. <laughs> shit. And that's so true. I don't, I don't doubt that for a second. I, so how old were you when you found out you were queer or figured out? Um, honestly, like I, I knew since I was really little, like when I was three or four in kindy, I had a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Um, but I think I like repressed it a bit because i think my parents were like oh no she's just like your friend or whatever right um oh wait do you guys have kindy like you that translates right like kindergarten kindergarten yeah cool i never know what's going to translate and what's not um and then when i was so then i was like no 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 i'm straight like let's knock that off and then when i was like but honestly like i still just got crazy crushes on like my female um and male friends and then I remember when I was uh 15 16 about that um I can remember the restaurant I was in and what I was eating but my (laughs) friends were teasing me that I was in love with one of my best friends who wasn't there at the time um she was in like a separate friend group and they're like you love her you love her and I did and I had oh. to kind of, like, admit that I did. And it was, like, good nature teasing. Like, it wasn't yeah. um, nasty or anything. Like, everyone was happy for me. No one was, like, being a dick about it. Um, and I did love her very much. And we kind of had, like, a complicated relationship, her and mm. I. Um, which kind of, like, fucked me up a little bit. But, yeah. you know, that's what first loves are supposed to do, right? That's the truth. And then, so then I was, like, oh, I'm bisexual. And then I held on to that for a pretty long time. I found that really, really hurtful being bisexual because um, I've written a, an article about this, but... People hate that term, Yeah, too. as soon as you say it, like, people... What, what I discovered, so, like, even though I had this, like, lengthy relationship with her that's very tumultuous and an intense emotional investment, we didn't really, like, fuck. Right. Like, not in the sense that, like, yeah. I feel like I do now. So, like, I wasn't, like, a very – even at that time, I still wasn't that sexual. Mm-hmm. And I was a young person, like, maybe by this age, like, 16, 17, by the time I was, like, okay, I'm bi. Mm-hmm. Um, by the t- also, by the way, my parents grounded me, but whatever. Um, Shut up, for real. <laughs> yeah, they grounded me. Fuck. Um, but people, like, immediately sexualized me when I said, like, I was bisexual. 100%. They're like, oh, you love having sex with women. Yeah. And they were, like, really creepy and I hated it. Um, <laughs> and then when I started trying to date, if I was dating a woman, they didn't like that I was bisexual because they were yes. like, oh, you're dirty, you fuck dudes. Yes. And then when I was dating men, they were so paranoid I was going to cheat on them. Right, and I was like, right. what the fuck? And then by that age, I was starting to realize that there, there wasn't just two genders, like that that's really conforming and a lot of people don't identify as male or female. Um... And so then politically, I was like, I don't like saying bisexual at all because like I would totally date someone that was gender non-binary or trans, etc. I don't really know why I don't like the label pansexual, but I don't. It just doesn't do anything for me. But queer, I was like, this is, this is it. 
I'm mm. so fucking queer because I, you know, can be attracted to anyone regardless of gender and gender expression and uh, sexual uh, biology as well. And as a per- I really like reclaiming stuff. And I know yes. that queer has been a re- – and it's been interesting talking to older people and they – some older people find it challenging that like my generation is re you know accepting Igniting that but I like yeah. it I don't know I, I really I'm into reclamation I like that a lot I feel the same way uh I consider myself pansexual um but I do like the umbrella of que- I had similar for instances with the bisexuality mm-hmm. my husband as well when when you say you're bisexual people Gay people, straight yeah. people, everybody. No one likes it. No one's about it. No one it. fucking Except other likes it. people. They're exactly. Like, oh, They're like, relief. fucking pick a side, dude. Yeah, pick Let's a side. Let's go. Or that it's, what is it like? It's just a pit stop on the way to being right. gay. Or, oh, yeah, you're just you're just not sure that you're a lesbian. Yeah, like, like, dude, from no. the time I was four, I was sure yeah, of I like sexuality. I like all of it, and I'm <laughs> into it. And the other thing that I think pansexuality Saying sexuality after something mm-hmm. is like, yeah. why do I have to explain this to you? Yeah, like why that's true. I'm pan One of the things sexual. that I really like about queer is that I find it kind of subversive and sneaky. Yes, exactly. And I like that when I say it, someone either goes cool. Or it provides this, like, interesting, thought-provoking conversation of, like, what does that mean to you instead right. of them having this, like, idea of, of how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Of, like, oh Plus, like, God. I don't fucking – I don't know. Like, I, I'm pretty out about being queer because I – I acknowledge I'm an extremely privileged person. Like, I'm cisgender. I'm white. I'm all right looking. Like, I, I really, short of being male, like, I've really ding, 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 yeah. ding, like, hit that lotter. Nailed it. So I try to be, like, very out about everything, being queer, being kinky, you know, all of it, because I feel like it's the responsibility of people in priv- uh, positions of privilege to do that. And that's why, like, on my Instagram, I talk about things like white privilege, even though a lot of white people hate me for that. Um, <laughs> like, fuck them. Um, that's fine. You don't have to follow me. Yeah, you, you um, need to fucking The amount of conversations I've had that, like, people on my Instagram be like, white privilege isn't real. I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, let's let's have a great convo about that. Or, or reverse racism. That's my oh. favorite when I hear that. I'm like, did you just say? Oh, my God. All right. okay. But like my friends who are people of color are like, they will say to me that we, that they really appreciate that I do have these conversations with other white people Absolutely. because just like, um, sexual assault is predominantly experienced by women. We shouldn't have to be explaining to men why they shouldn't do it. Men should have that conversation with other men. I believe that like mm-hmm. sexual assault is a male issue and they yes. should be addressing it amongst themselves. Absolutely. Um, not to say that I don't do the work in educating and having conversations around it, but I see race as like the same thing as like the white people should talk to other white people, but like, Hey, knock that off. Right. A hundred percent. So yeah, I'm pretty out about being queer, but like, um, conversationally and like in my one-on-one personal life, it's not something that I feel like people should have to announce like the, right. Who like, they're why? into. Like, it's so weird. What genitalia are you into? Yeah. That's like basically yeah. what they're saying. Exactly. And it's like, what why? Why fuck? do you care? Do you try to fuck? Like, yeah. Wait, Cause I'm this, not interested in you. Cause we're going to have to hit some other boundary <laughs> points before we get there and yeah. court me a little. Well, please. it's like I um, have had trans friends and partners in the past and the amount of questions like they get when coming out as trans is really painful and like really specific stuff about their genitals and it's kind of the same thing it's like can't we figure out how to be accepting mm-hmm. and interesting uh, sorry interested in other people without being like fetishizing or creepy right a hundred percent why not all of this to me is like grade school stuff i know it's like it's so- don't tell people how they feel and don't ask creepy questions about people's genitals. Yeah, like it's so weird. I'm sorry. Does your dick hang to the left or to the right? Yeah. Well, uh, that would be interesting. Like when people ask about that, just to like be like, tell me very specifically what type of genitals you look for in a partner. Right. Like, like <laughs> is that gonna be in the checkoff list? Okay. Just I make mean, them uncomfortable. If, yeah. Freaking it. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here, folks. <laughs> Not gonna lie to you, and it is. A pleasure. Thank oh, you for having so, me on. It was so really nice. much. This was so awesome, and I'm s- so excited for your knowledge and enlightenment. I and heartfelt 
like everything. It got me in the heart center a few Aww, times today. That so was nice. really, really beautiful. It was um, a pleasure. Thank you. I'm so excited. And do you want to say the name of your podcast? Oh, so yeah. So I have a podcast uh, or I'm in a podcast. We're a group. I feel weird saying I have it because we're all like in it together. Um, but it's called the Sex Magic Podcast. And you can find us on Instagram at Sex Magic Podcast or anywhere at Sex Magic Podcast. And if you're looking for me on Insta, you can find me at Bella Took a Photo or online. It's just IsabellaFrappier.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm. Thanks, everyone. Uh, look for the photo shoot, too. We'll link it. Uh, and have a fabulous, sexy day.